Good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Wheat. I am a member of the Germana Foundation. I have been on the board since 1997, and I was president from 2008 until this last November 2020. And uh, for those of you who are new, I, I welcome you to the Germana Foundation. Uh, we have uh, a lot of interesting things to learn and a lot of interesting things to show that we have developed uh, over time uh, that we think makes our, our site a very interesting site and maybe someday uh, a National Historic Landmark. So um, uh, you might recognize this, those of you who have come to the Visitor Center, that is, uh, that is our weather vane uh, in honor of the many immigrants who have come to Germana and whether you are descendants from some of the original peoples uh, that, uh, that lived at Germana, or you are the first one in your family to visit, we, we welcome you. So uh, next slide here. So Germana has been at the, uh, at the center of controversy uh, in its role in the American history uh, for well over a hundred years. And uh, the man who put to Germana front and center uh, in his controversial thesis, uh, which you know may have launched a thousand dissertations, is uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, probably the most uh, famous of, uh, of American historiographers of the uh, 19th century. Uh, he posited a thesis called the frontier in American history. And the frontier in American history posits that it was the American experience on the frontier where we had uh, uh, settlers had cut their ties uh, to, to various, um, various sources of their culture and, um, and their homeland and had to form new ties, a new understanding of what their, uh, what their role was on the American frontier. And, um, and so I wanted to, um, um, wanted to read an excerpt from, um, from, from Frederick Jackson Turner's book, The Frontier in American History. Um, and uh, this, this text copyright that I have is from his uh, 1920 version. So he is, um, um, he, he sets, this, he sets the, the, the story at the frontier uh, of, uh, of Virginia. This is on page 90 from his 1920 version. The occupation of the Virginia Piedmont received a special impetus from the interest which Governor Spotswood took in the frontier. In 1710, he proposed a plan for intercepting the French in their occupation of the interior by inducing Virginia settlement to proceed along one side of the James River only until this column of advancing pioneers should strike the attenuated line of French posts in the center. In the same year, he sent a body of horsemen to the top of the Blue Ridge where they could overlook the Valley of Virginia. By 1714, he became, an act, he became active as a colonizer himself. 30 miles above the falls of the Rappahannock or the Rapidan at Germana, he settled a little village of German redemptioners who in return for having the passage paid agreed to serve without wages for a term of years to engage in his ironworks, also to act as rangers on the frontier. From here in 1716, two companies of rangers and four Indians, Governor Spotswood and a band of Virginia gentlemen made a summer picnic excursion of two weeks across the Blue Ridge in the Shenandoah Valley. Sic juva transcendere montes, was the motto of these Knights of the Golden Horseshoe. Uh, it's also the motto of the Germana Foundation. If you look at our uh, old um, uh, 1956 logo uh, and um, as the governor dubbed them, but they were not the warlike Christian men destined to occupy the frontier. Um, so so key to, to, uh, to Turner's um, thesis was, was the role of the, of the Germana pioneers on the frontier of Virginia. And he was very clear that Germana 
was one of those jumping off points that carried American civilization uh, further west. And this was a this was a thesis that really um, captured much of American history for many years until um, uh, until there were people taking shots at it and really questioning whether whether our pioneers really did cut themselves off from the old world. And if we go to the next slide, the, um, the, most, the most influential challenger uh, to, um, uh, to, this, to this thesis of, of the frontier in American history was Bernard Balin of Harvard University and uh, his school of thought, which is called the Atlantic History. And um, if I could um, read a little bit to you a little about Bernard Balin, who just recently died, I think in the last year and a half um, at the age of 97. Um, Harvard historian Bernard Balin has persuasively written, far from being isolated, the people of Germana participated in complex transatlantic familial, confessional, political, and trade networks that shaped not only North America, but also Europe, South America, and Africa. It was the constant flow of people, communications, and trade goods that transformed the Atlantic Ocean uh, into what Fordham University historian Ross Hoffman called the Inland Sea of Western Civilization. So we will let's let's examine a little bit about that. Well, you know, one of the things that that Bernard Balin wrote as he was looking at the Atlantic history, where anything that might be happening on the American frontier influenced settlement patterns and um, uh, communications from their country of origin, but also impacted the west coast of Africa as the demand for importing. Um, enslaved people grew up. So the whole, the whole uh, North Atlantic uh, was dramatically tied together by, um, uh, by these settlements. And, and he writes about the trade, this is in uh, Atlantic history, which is there, uh, there on the slide. I'm reading from page 96. Uh, the Atlantic tr uh, trade do drew flour and wine from the Aquitaine, cloth from the Sedan and Languedoc, canvas from Western France, lace from Valenciennes or Puy, and silk stockings and glove from Cévan and Dauphin. So too the lives of Germans in remote corners of the Neckar Valley in Württemberg and in the Kreisgau were impacted by ties of their countrymen to North America. And that's that. those are the Germana people, the people that left from that area in the Kreisgau, he's referring, he's referring to Germana. And in his, uh, in his earlier book called uh, Voyagers to the West, he, uh, he details it a little, bit, a little bit more. So he is, remember, he is trying to show uh, that Frederick Jackson Turner was wrong. Here's Bernard Balin. In 1714, Spotswood had initiated the importation of skilled German iron workers. With the help of Baron von Grafenried, who had founded a settlement of Swiss and Germans in North Carolina, he rescued a group of about 42 German iron workers and their families stranded in London, contracted with them for three years of labor in the ironworks he planned, and established them in a tiny palisaded log cabin settlement he called Germana at the edge of Virginia's northern frontier. These Germans, part of the first sizable exodus from the Upper Rhine through the Rotterdam and England to America, had been recruited for other purposes by the chief miner, uh, this was Albrecht, to Queen Anne. They came, as many other such workers would, from the ancient iron working district of Nassau Siegen. 45 miles east of the Rhine. What these Ziegelanders, living very, quote, very miserably, 30 miles from any inhabitants, he's quoting a, um, a John Fontaine's diary from uh, 1715, um, made of life in the primitive world of frontier Virginia, so different from the populous, elaborately institutionalized Rhineland communities they had lived in before, we will never know. But before they left Germana for land of their own, 
even deeper in the Virginia frontier, they established the ironworks Spotswood wanted, and they were soon followed by others. Alsatians and then a variety of other Rhinelanders took over at Germanna in 1717, and the tradition was established. So here we have two of, uh, of America's most famous historiographers, uh, both in contention for what they said is the core of, uh, of American character and growth. And they, uh, they are both using Germana to prove their point. And I think being in the center of a controversy is exactly where Germana needs to be to illustrate the importance of this site because people are still undecided um, uh, to uh, the importance of the of the site and how does how does uh, how does Germana figure into the American narrative? Let's go to the next slide. Now, you know, Germana, many of the people uh, who are watching this evening are descended from, um, from the Germans and, and some are from the English who lived at Germana. But we have to remember that uh, um, we have identified through archaeology uh, some very important sites um, right around Germana that may go back 10,000 years. And the only way that we know of these people is through archaeological investigation. Uh, the, mo the most recent, um, the most recent uh, Native Americans to inhabit at Germana uh, were the Monacans um, and, um, and the Manahoaks. Uh, these were part of a, um, uh, a network of, of um, Suan speakers uh, who were different than uh, many of us are familiar with um, uh, the stories of uh, the Powhatan Indians engaging with the Jamestown colonists. Those were Algonquian speakers. They, this is a different family of, um, uh, of languages. Uh, that they were not mutually intelligible. And so uh, the Monacans and the um, Manahoaks, we know about from their contact uh, with James Smith, um, uh, John Smith rather, and others of the Jamestown settlement. And so we were able, through his, uh, through his interactions and diaries uh, and other writings, um, some of that initial contact with Europeans was reduced to writing. And so that's something that we uh, cherish. And so the, um, the Monacans were um, different from the Powhatans and they're recognizable in, uh, in archeology span in that um, the Powhatans lived in, in rather long uh, rectangular buildings and the, the, the Monacans lived in round buildings like, uh, like what we see here. And as you can see, there's very little there that might survive archeological investigation uh, because it was all forest products and would, when it would quickly return to the soil. And the often, oftentimes the only thing that we can identify uh, these areas were uh, find a campsite, uh, look for where the fire pit was and see if we can identify some post holes. And if the post holes look circular, then we know it's a Monacan uh, village. Uh, but again, we're not sure how long they inhabited the area around Germana. Um, um, we do know um, we, we do know that there was a village near Germana. Uh, that was referred to in the historical period, but we're not exactly sure if it is on the property that the Germana Foundation owns now, or if it was on the other side of the Rapidan um, in, an, uh, in an area called uh, Foxhead. So, um, but these people were, um, they, they planted the so-called three sisters crops, which were all you know, quite familiar with as Americans that had an influence on our diet of corn, beans, and squash. They domesticated sunflowers. Uh, they relied on certain game um, like uh, deer and elk, other small game. 
And we know that they traded with the Powhatans because they were, they were copper miners as well. And that was very much uh, appreciated as a trade good by the Powhatans. And they also traded as far north as the Iroquois Confederacy um, up in New York. And that becomes um, very important when we get to the time of Governor Alexander Spotswood. Um, there were uh, a related tribe, uh, um, uh, well, they were, there were a trade that were nearby uh, spoke a similar language, and um, they were Iroquoian um, ancestrally. Uh, maybe hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they they came from uh, the Great Lakes and then migrated south to Virginia. And um, it's uncertain how long that they lived um, in Virginia. It might have been for hundreds of years, but they were um, native to North Carolina and Virginia. Um, they um, had waged war uh, against the uh, uh, European settlements. There was a, um, a Swiss settlement in New Bern, North Carolina, uh, that was largely destroyed by the Tuscarora. And um, a division of the Tuscarora nation had been approached by Governor Spotswood to guard the frontier. And after this disturbance, um, they... Um, they decided that they were no longer going to be guarding the frontier of uh, Virginia uh, against the French and their Indian allies. And so they ultimately migrated north and became the sixth nation of the Iroquois Confederacy. So that, that left the frontier vulnerable to uh, French designs and um, Governor Spotswood, working with a Swiss gentleman named the Baron de Groffenried, uh, located some Germans to plant them on the, on the frontier. Um, can we go to the next, next slide, please? Uh, this is Queen Anne, and it was under Queen Anne um, who appointed Governor Alexander Spotswood uh, to be the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia. The actual Royal Governor remained behind. He hired, uh, Spotswood. Um, and so Spotswood was the man on the spot, uh, kind of the, uh, the Latin term for lieutenant, uh, French Latin. So if we could go to the next slide. Governor Spotswood, you see him in, uh, in his uh, official portrait that you may have seen many times at the Germana Visitor Center and also uh, 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 portrayed by Dennis Loba here is probably the greatest governor of Virginia. Very energetic, very forward thinking, um, had a dramatic impact on, on Virginia history. Um, go to the, the next slide, please. He had um, come from a long line of very prominent Scots, um, including, um, including an Archbishop of Scotland um, who played a very important role in the transition from uh, Roman Catholic Scotland to, uh, to the Reformed religion and the Reformation. And um, um, very important in Scotland, um, but by about the time that he was born, his family had fallen a little bit on hard times, and they were, de they were dependent on finding um, finding their path upward uh, through the expansion of uh, the British Empire that was under the, uh, under the control of primarily uh, English decision makers in Parliament and, um, and English, um, English monarchs. Let's go to the next, next page. Um, and, you know, we don't want to forget the English and the Scottish. We also have to remember that there was a lot of ferment on the continent where there was a lot of, um, of alliances and, um, and communication among the Protestants in Western Europe. Uh, for England, they, were, um, they had been um, very concerned about a, uh, a Roman Catholic attack on England. Uh, remember the, uh, uh, 
um, the great Spanish Armada of 1588. Uh, they were always worried that the French would support um, an alternative monarch, uh, which happened in uh, 1715 in the, the first uh, rising of the Scots. And then again, under uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1745, this was a little bit later in our discussion. Um, so there's always concerns there. And so the, the British wanted to, um, wanted to settle as many armed Protestant families as they possibly could along the frontier. And, um, and the Baron de Graff had read from Bern, Switzerland, which was a reformed city, um, served as an agent selling his services to the British crown to recruit uh, Protestants in uh, German-speaking areas throughout Western Europe. And he succeeded in, in planting a colony in New Bern um, um, of uh, German and, and Swiss people, um, but that was largely destroyed by the Tuscarora in 1711. And uh, he found himself penniless, uh, but in somewhat in a, the service of Governor Spotswood to look for Germans to uh, populate the frontier, to guard the frontier of, of Virginia. Uh, next slide, please. So he succeeded in, um, Spotswood let it be known to his, uh, his um, agent in London, um, uh, Blankiston, who had been the, governor, the royal governor of Maryland. And Blankiston was told by Spotswood that he had found some iron ore deposits that he was very interested in having uh, miners brought in from, uh, from Europe to exploit. Uh, examine the, the value of the iron ore and see if we could, uh, uh, if he could develop this into an iron uh, productive uh, pr producing area. Uh, now, I, I, <clears throat> I learned from uh, Thomas Sowell, who had written a book on, uh, on human migration, uh, that Germans at this time in Europe were very highly sought after by other European powers to exploit newly discovered uh, metal deposits. So um, up, in, up in Sweden, they had discovered uh, iron and copper. Up in the central parts of Sweden, Germans were recruited to work up there. In Russia, they had found iron deposits, other valuable metal, metals in the Ural Mountains. Germans were recruited to go there. In Britain, uh, they were recruiting Germans to exploit uh, metal deposits in uh, Wales and uh, also Cornwall. So it was uh, not, not too, uh, too far afield to expect that they would be recruited and uh, planted in America. So uh, Ziegen had been known as an ironworking area since Celtic times. And um, um, everyone in the, in the area was very familiar with uh, uh, ironworking and, and uh, uh, metallurgy of some sort. And in fact, the, the reason we know so much of their deep ancestry is that we can go back hundreds of years in uh, the Ziegerland uh, because of, uh, of uh, tax records, uh, fractional shares in mines and um, hammers that were used to purify the iron. Um, so it was a good place to recruit what Spotswood was looking for. Uh, next slide, please. And so our uh, settlers were planted there on a five-sided fort, um, probably built by uh, military engineers under Spotswood's direction. And um, uh, spots, and the, the, the reason we think that is that uh, there's another five sided fort that's very regular. And the archaeologists have found um, all five points of our sister fort called Fort Christana uh, down in still a rather remote part of Virginia, um, uh, down in, in southern Virginia, which was built primarily as an Indian trading post. Um, but uh, the five points of the Pentagon are 100 yards apart. 
And you know that is precise enough that we would imagine that those were military people that built it, not, not settlers. And so um, that's where we find these some 42 uh, German speaking colonists uh, on the frontier of, of Virginia. Uh, uh, three years later, more uh, Germans came. They were from uh, possibly a slightly different dialect. Maybe it was dramatically different to some of the ears 300 years ago, uh, but they tended to come from um, um, the area around Kreisgau in modern Baden-Württemberg. Uh, some of these people ancestrally uh, were Austrians and Swiss who moved north and if they retained their dialect, it would have been quite different than the Ziegerlanders. Um, but we had imagined after, uh, after a bit of time, um, they, would, they would understand one another well. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, we, we're still looking for the fort. Um, Dr. Eric Larson is our archaeologist. Uh, leading a team to try to locate the, uh, the outlines of the fort. And uh, archeologist Bill Kelso, who has uh, uh, joined our board um, since giving this quote, and I just think it's just wonderful. Uh, Kelso was uh, um, the world, probably the most famous archeologist in the world today. And he had discovered that uh, the fort at Jamestown still exists. And, um, and has not been washed away. And uh, so what he says comes with great authority, I think. And so he, he said, I have always thought that the Fort Germana and Enchanted Castle site ranks among the most significant historical archeological sites, certainly in Virginia and arguably in the nation. And, you know, and also given the, uh, the intergenerational shooting match between Frederick Jackson Turner and his uh, devotees and the followers of, of uh, Bernard Balin and the Atlantic history. Certainly it's a controversial area and, uh, and hopefully um, archeology span will, will bring, those, uh, bring those arguments more in a, in a broader circulation. Can we go to the next slide. A very remarkable thing happened in 1716, and that is called the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe Expedition. And this is one of the earliest documented times where we had a, a mixture of cultures that are so important to the uh, American story. Um, we have here Governor Spotswood, who is... Uh, um, to the right of the Indian guide. Uh, we have some grandees from the lower part of Virginia um, who Spotswood wanted to bring up beyond the frontier at Germana, uh, going into the, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains to find suitable lands that they might purchase and settle, again, with armed Protestant families. Uh, for the great game against the French in North America. The man on the, um, the far left is portraying John Fontaine, who was a, uh, from a French Huguenot family who lived in Ireland um, for a time seeking refuge. And then they found they made their way to Virginia. And John Fontaine's diary of his visit to Germana in 1715 and then again in 1716 for the uh, Knights of the Golden Horseshoe Expedition, those are the only descriptions of the dimensions of the fort. We know that there was a baker's dozen of uh, tenement houses. We know that there was a little street and across the little street were pigsties. Uh, right across the street from all of these, all of these houses. Um, we know from Fontaine's description uh, that the Germans had a blockhouse in the center that they used um, every day for, uh, for prayers. And then on Sunday, there were two sermons a day. 
uh, if the walls, which were built to um, withstand a musket fire, were to fall under an attack, uh, within the fort, there were uh, two artillery pieces that Sp Spotswood describes, um, and uh, the blockhouse would be their last refuge. And uh, we, we find examples of some of these blockhouses elsewhere in, uh, in North America. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Now, the the exact numbers of people and who exactly participated in this expedition is not um, is not well documented. Again, we we really are going off of uh, Fontaine's diary uh, because there what there are no not many um, not many documents that survive the period. Maybe there was a clear uh, listing of all the people who participated. But if there were a listing, it would probably only list the, the prominent gentlemen. It's doubtful that they would have named um, people who were not gentlemen. So this would include uh, the Indian guides, any African slaves that might have been brought or uh, if they were uh, freedmen. Um, and we do know that, um, that many of the uh, German-speaking men who were inhabiting Fort Germana uh, had been hired um, to be rangers. And, I had, and since the rangers would be responsible for scouting out the frontier and going well beyond uh, the area of Germana to find uh, other sources of water, perhaps, uh, other deposits of ores that they uh, wanted to investigate. I would imagine that these rangers would have gone along as well to complement uh, the Indian guides, but we have no evidence that the Germans went along with them. Um, but it just, it just seems very likely that Spotswood would have used them in that way since he had been paying for their expenses to serve as rangers uh, since 1714. Uh, if we go to the next, um, um, next slide. After the, after the Germans moved on in 1720 and moved to what is now Southern Fauquier in Germantown, uh, many of the other German speakers who had arrived in 1717 stayed on because they were still under indentures. They still had to work as servants um, in some respect to Governor Spotswood. And we think when the first group of, of Germans moved on, this is when Spotswood started construction of what uh, William Byrd called the Enchanted Castle. And this was a monumental home um, comparable to what you see in Colonial Williamsburg today, the reconstruction. Um, designed by Governor Spotswood. Spotswood was an elegant designer. He designed um, uh, the completion of Bruton Parish Church um, and I think the Wren Building when it had burned at the College of William and Mary. Um, so this was a, um, a statement of his power, his intelligence, and um, his dominion over the Virginia landscape. And very likely, uh, this house was built with uh, some of these in, indentured Germans who were from the Kreisgau and other areas, Baden-Württemberg, um, in the uh, southern end of Germany, and probably African slaves as well. Um, and we just don't know exactly when the slaves arrived, but we do know that when William Byrd arrived, uh, to visit Spotswood in 1732 and, and gave it the nickname Enchanted Castle because he was always, I think, uh, <clears throat> less than respectful to uh, Governor Spotswood. Um, he said that from the porch, you could see the ruinous tenements where the Germans had lately lived. And uh, remember, they had been, the Germans had been gone from these baker dozen, baker's dozen of uh, um, houses uh, for, you know, um, some years in 1720. So 12 years, um, they had been gone. And so I, you know, I imagine other people think too, is that uh, these, these German um, cabins 
were probably used for the enslaved population that were that were there. And so if we discover um, if we discover where these huts were, you know, we're going to be probably looking for uh, uh, signs of fireplaces and the like, or or dugout holes where they would keep things um, underneath the foundation. Uh, it will be a, a mix of um, of uh, artifacts from the Germans and also from the Africans who lived there. So it will be a fascinating thing when we uh, discover this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so from uh, from the Enchanted Castle, uh, we have Lady Spotswood up there, Butler Brain uh, from England. After Spotswood's death, um, he was uh, he died in in uh, Annapolis, uh, preparing to uh, engage a naval war on behalf of the English uh, against the Spanish, and was planning on uh, 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 attacking. Uh, what is now Colombia, uh, but did, but died before he left. Uh, so um, Lady Spotswood married the Reverend John Thompson, uh, came from a very wealthy family from Ulster, and uh, um, uh, he had served as the pastor, um, an Anglican pastor, uh, for uh, a, a church that we sometimes... Uh, sometimes visit, uh, it's called the uh, Little Fork Church. Um, and from time to time when we have our reunions in person, uh, uh, that's one of the places where many of our attendees uh, worship. And Spotswood, or, uh, um, uh, the Reverend was the, uh, the pastor there. Uh, next slide. Now we are not we are not certain when uh, slaves from Africa arrived at the Germana site. Um, probably the 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 first time that they uh, that there were Africans uh, at Germana was probably in 1716 at the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe expedition. I just imagine that there was um, that was the first contact and. Uh, probably not the first time that the Germans had seen Africans. They probably saw them when they arrived in Virginia, uh, maybe even saw them for the first time in uh, London when they had overstayed for a winter preparing to go to America. Um, and um, this, is a, this is a slide that uh, I found from uh, Dr. Gossett. Um, and I think it's really, uh, really amazing to see the large flows of people uh, who had been uh, captured, sold to Europeans, and, um, and, and moving across the Atlantic in gigantic numbers. Um, modern, <clears throat> modern scholars think that maybe 12 and a half million people uh, were sold to Europeans uh, for importation into the Western Hemisphere. Um, 10 and a half million people survived the Atlantic Passage. So, you know, maybe 2 million people died uh, at sea uh, coming to the Western Hemisphere. And, uh, and of those 10 and a half million people, maybe 338,000 came to North America. Could you, uh, next slide, please. So, um, Henry Louis Gates, um, many of you know and love his show on, on, uh, on tracing ancestry on PBS. Um, he, um, he's a great scholar in his, in his own right and, and takes people's interest in, in, uh, in genealogy and teaches a lot of history to Americans. And so he is just a, a tremendous guy. And in fact, uh, Finding Your Roots uh, was the first time that the Germana Foundation uh, made it onto national TV. Um, um, there was a, um, a celebrity, um, Neil Patrick Harris, uh, who had descended from uh, a woman who was put to death in Germany as a witch. And uh, uh, this woman, Gertrude Stuhl, 
uh, was an ancestor of some of the Germana colonists. And so uh, Kathy Clore Frost and uh, Elke Hall and, and a number of other uh, people, Barb Price, there was just a whole team of, of, of Germana researchers that helped um, help provide the show with documentation uh, on this important line. And um, it, was a, it was a thrill to see some of our research be on national TV. But one of the points that, uh, that Henry Louis Gates makes about those 12 and a half million Africans who uh, were enslaved that ended up with 388,000 people in North America over that entire period. And from those 388,000 people, 42 million Americans trace their descent. That is just incredible. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk it, we'll talk it a little bit later about um, some of the strategies that we are working with, uh, with people to help find uh, their, their deep ancestry and perhaps find a, a connection to Germana. Uh, next slide. So with, uh, you know, if we could adopt uh, Turner's thesis about the westward expansion, we go from uh, after Lady Spotswood remarried, um, she and Reverend Thompson built Salubria, uh, which is just a remarkable house, may have been a model for Montpelier, which was the home of the Madisons on the other end of the of um, Orange County from Germana, and um, Doug Harnsberger has found a uh, an English pattern book, which he thinks uh, served the really talented carpenters uh, at Salubria, um, who, um, who who made it from this uh, this this uh, pattern book, and. Um, I just think it's very likely that um, Salubri was was built with a mixed labor force of, um, of very skilled and talented men, uh, free and unfree. Um, and you know, as uh, as slaves gain skills, um, the people who owned them um, lease them out to other people and. Um, um, we know we know from some of the historical record that that sometimes uh, these skilled tradesmen were able to keep some of their wages and not turn all of it over uh, to their master. So there were we're quite confident that there was a, a mixed labor force that built this really magnificent home uh, that was donated to the Germana Foundation in 2001 by the Grayson family. Uh, who had owned it since uh, prior to the Civil War and continues to own a farm that is around um, the 13 acres that uh, conveyed with Salubria. Um, next page, please. Um, as the, when the Germans from um, 1717 had completed their indentures to Governor Spotswood, uh, they wanted to get away from him as far as possible. And so they moved into what is now Madison County. Um, they had emigrated as a group, probably um, having met for the first time in London um, at, I think it's St. Mary's Lebeau, which was a chapel that was set aside for German speaking um, services. And so as a congregation, uh, they moved up to Madison County and raised funds uh, to build a church for them. And they twice uh, sent agents to Europe to raise money for the, for the church. And um, uh, many of our descendants who come to the Germana conferences and reunions have gone to Hebrew and Lutheran Church on the Sunday of the reunion uh, to worship. And the congregation brings out their old silver, um, which had been given to the fundraisers prior to the construction of the church in 1740. So these are very, very old uh, communion silver pieces and uh, predate this building. Um, 
and Hebrew and Lutheran Church considers the uh, the founding of their church to actually be 1717 in London. Uh, so this is uh, this is a congregation that moved together, still exists, um, and is just like a time capsule of uh, 300 years of of uh, continuity. Um, next slide. So um, bringing us up to the Revolutionary War, uh, Germana is a remarkable place and the, the impact of its people has been remarkable on our country. Uh, I think it's uh, September the 8th in 1781, um, um, uh, Lafayette's army crossed at, um, at Germana Ford. Um, you know, the reason people have been living nearby for 10,000 years is it's one of the uh, passable areas of the Rapidan River um, and has good stone for making points and other helpful things like that. So um, it was pretty natural for Lafayette to cross at Germana Ford um, as he was uh, fleeing some British forces and then looping around um, to connect up with uh, Washington and Rochambeau's forces at Yorktown. And um, we had a, a few Germana descendants to be witness of the Yorktown siege and, and that battle. Um, um, an interesting thing too, about how, uh, how America changed from um, 1714, 1717, um, a British frontier, uh, outpost of German speakers um, switched allegiance within uh, two generations. So Governor Spotswood's was uh, son John grew up at Germana at uh, at the Enchanted Castle. Um, he is now buried at in our memorial garden. So under the uh, under the black obelisk that marks the grave of of John Spotswood. John had two sons, uh, Colonel Alexander Spotswood, who served in the Virginia 2nd Regiment under George Washington, and Captain John Spotswood served under Washington in the 6th Regiment. Um, both of them, including um, Lafayette, uh, were all three members of the Society of the Cincinnati, which was founded by George Washington's Officer Corps in 1783. And uh, all three of those gentlemen are represented today in the society. The society continues to grow uh, by leaps and bounds uh, 240 years later. And um, uh, they've established the American Revolution Institute, which you can visit Anderson House, use the library. It's a, it's a remarkable organization. Um, all going all the way back to Germana. Uh, next slide, please. I want to um, really put out some great thanks uh, to Cookie Gover. Um, she has dived down into some documents that we have had for some time, uh, probably 12, 15 years of other research that other volunteers have done. And she's gone through and uh, matched up uh, documents that we have with uh, with digitized proofs that the Daughters of the American Revolution have, uh, have, have placed at our disposal. Um, she's looking for volunteers to help us match up with um, proven lines through Sons of the American Revolution and Society of the Cincinnati documents. Um, but she's identified 262 Germana patriots. Uh, there are another 249 patriots that um, may be Germana related, um, but we're not sure. So if you would like to volunteer, that is a great um, that is a great project that's going on. And what I think is fascinating and I think uh, really warrants more investigation is um, we have not found a single Germana person who uh, remained loyal to the king. Uh, I think when they were, when they were ready for American independence, they were all in. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing to explore. Let's go to the next page. 
by around 1800, we go, we go from the, the properties that uh, we've identified as, as sort of like the elite of, uh, of um, Virginia uh, down to just sort of a, um, uh, an ordinary yeoman farmer. Uh, Peter Hitt uh, is the grandson of the uh, man of the same name who was an original Germana colonist. Um, this um, cabin, um, uh, Christy Kendall, uh, our trustee, who is also a Hitt descendant, is going to be giving a presentation on this on this cabin and will reveal some interesting uh, information that we've learned through dendrochronology, which is comparing tree ring growth of some of the timbers to identify uh, perhaps when it was built. Uh, so this is a very rare cabin. Uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, really, really nice things survive uh, over a 300 year period or 200 year period in this case. Um, rather ordinary things don't. You know, when you're eating off a wooden plate and you break the wooden plate, you throw it in the fire. And we don't have any evidence of, of those things. So it's kind of like this kind of cabin is very rare uh, because they uh, oftentimes were, uh, were destroyed um, along the way. So we're very grateful to, to have this cabin under the protection of the Germana Foundation and uh, this was uh, uh, donated to us by a wonderful man, uh, a real hero of mine, Russell Hitt. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, by 1861, what, uh, re what remained of, uh, of Germana as a struggling little community, mostly it had uh, uh, mills and the like, uh, was largely destroyed um, because this was a fortified area uh, on the Germana side of the Rapidan by Confederate forces and um, uh, was a flashpoint because it was one of the few areas where the Rapidan, which was much uh, bigger uh, 150 years ago than it is today, uh, difficult to cross except at Germana Ford. Um, so here we see uh, grants forces crossing a pontoon bridge at Germana Ford. We, um, that's on the other side of the highway. We own that, uh, that site now um, since 2013 when we uh, acquired the 62 acre site uh, that we call the archeology span site. And you'll see the, um, see the covered wagons and all the horses and all the men. Um, they are preparing for the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, I think in May 8th, 1864, that is the first time that Grant faced off against Robert E. Lee, uh, was at that engagement just up the road from Germana. Um, and we have scars on our earth uh, to prove um, of, about some of the engagements that happened. And uh, we may have identified a witness tree that still survives from, uh, from that period. Um, Lee, by the way, was a uh, uh, descendant of Alexander Spotswood. So um, in a way, the salubria that we own is one of, one of the ancestral homes of the, of the Lees as well through the Spotswood line. Um, next uh, slide, please. Another view. Um, um, sketched by one of the um, one of the war correspondents of crossing through Germana. Next slide. Um, we're all the way up to um, uh, post World War II, and it's it's interesting. We've we've talked about all of these people that have interacted with Germana over the years. Um, it is amazing what the um, you know, nearly 250 year memory um, at this point still existed. So um, there had been continuing uh, connections between researchers and descendants uh, from the Germana community um, back with their ancestral villages in Germany. And that was all interrupted during the Nazi period. Um, but there was you know, there was a memory of, of Americans who descended from these people after the war. So on the, um, 
uh, Ziegen, who is going to be rededicating the Nikolai Kircha on the 10th anniversary of its bombing by um, uh, British, uh, British bombers on December the 16th, 1944. So on December the 16th, 1954, they were going to be rededicating the church to Christian worship. And um, the organizers had written to the president of our predecessor organization before it was a foundation and asked for a letter of greeting on behalf of uh, Americans who descended from people who had worshiped at this church uh, prior to 1714. And so that, that letter was um, written by uh, Dr. Huffman and uh, was translated into German, read at the rededication, and then published in the Ziegener Zeitung. And um, uh, Ernst Flender's sister, Hannah, clipped it out, mailed it to him. He was in Manhattan uh, working on Wall Street. And uh, it, just, it just captured his imagination that there were these Americans who still remembered uh, that they had descended from people who had come from Ziegen and settled on the American frontier uh, uh, 250 years earlier. So through his generosity, he came, got to know Dr. Huffman, and uh, through his generosity, gave uh, a very large uh, amount of Texas oil company stock um, that my, our predecessors sold and bought 270 acres of the original settlement. So what's fascinating is all the things that you see at Germana, it all got started by a German who succeeded in America. Next slide. So here are um, our founders. Uh, Ernst Flender uh, is there in the, uh, at about the uh, two o'clock. Um, Broadus Martin, who had, he had been the, uh, the president of, uh, of our predecessor organization and had started, um, started having picnics at Germana in the 1940s. And uh, we asked why on earth would he pick the hottest weekend of the year, which was the third weekend of July uh, in Virginia. And the response from his uh, daughter was, well, that was Papa's birthday. <laughs> so if you ever wondered why we get totally roasted in July is because that's about the time of Broadus Martin's birthday. Uh, uh, Dr. Charles Huffman um, was our first president um, uh, of the Germana Foundation. And we have uh, Border Stanley, Frank Switzer, uh, Trammell Fishbach, uh, Jesse Boyd Carpenter was a very prominent businessman in, in, uh, in Culpeper. Uh, that's B.C. Holtzclaw, Benjamin Holtzclaw, the famous author of Germana Record Number no. 5. He was a uh, um, Rhodes Scholar and a uh, longtime professor at the University of Richmond. And then John Walter Wayland uh, was one the founding chairman of the history department of what is now James Madison University. Next slide. This is uh, um, a, an early photograph, probably about 1957 or 58. I don't know. We I'm, I'm sure we have it in one of our books. Um, but the the early members wanted to recall this five sided Pentagon, and so they had a little little picnic area that recalled that. And uh, it stood when I when I first came in contact with, with Germana in 1994 or so, uh, it was still standing in a very dilapidated state. And it is um, a little bit too, as you're walking to the visitor center, it was, it was a little bit to the left. That's where it stood. Um, but you can see this is, this is a huge turnout um, on the Sunday of the reunion. And these are all various descendants of the, of the Germans. Next slide, please. Um, even before we had any kind of building, it was, you know, Germana Foundation was mostly a mailing list. And we had worked very hard to find people to draw them back to the land where their American story began. 
And the way that we worked to reach out to them was uh, an aggressive publications program. Um, so, you know, the what I read to you earlier from uh, Bernard Balin, uh, he cites our first publication, which was um, um, uh, published in 1957 um, by uh, Dr. Wayland. Um, this, the, the books you see, um, you see here are modern publications, uh, B.C. Holtzclaw's book there, Ancestry and Descendants of the Nassau Segan Immigrants. That's a, a reprint of what he had written in 1964. And we've added some supplemental material and photographs that were taken on the many trips that the Germana Foundation has had to, um, to back to Germany to connect people to their ancestral villages. Uh, next slide. In 2000, um, a combination of grants and aggressive fundraising uh, among descendants, uh, we built the um, uh, Fort Germana uh, Visitor Center, uh, named after Broadus Martin, uh, designed by Douglas Harnberg Harnsberger. Um, and uh, my first Germana meeting was a, a building design that he had proposed and People weren't too wild about it. They sent him back to the drawing board and he came up with this five-sided building with a cupola on top to remind ourselves of the uh, block house that was in the middle and everyone loved it and raised the money for it. And uh, the flooring that's in it came from a wood mill from a descendant that was laid down. Um, you see many of the cabinetry and the furniture is from Clor. Um, E.A. Clore and Sons, uh, furniture manufacturers since about 1834, 1835. It's one of the oldest continually operating companies in America. Um, it's just a fabulous place. And if you haven't, if you haven't visited, you need to come. Uh, it has been a, a group effort across generations. Next slide, please. Uh, then we built the, uh, the Memorial Garden and um, you will recognize many, many, many familiar names uh, on these pavers. Uh, the Standing Stones commemorate uh, um, early colonists and uh, uh, trustees of the Germana Foundation, the founders, uh, Jesse Board Carpenter and, and others. And, um, and then uh, the little structure behind to keep people out of the blasting sun of Virginia in the in the summer uh, was built by um, um, Dr. Michael Frost, a descendant of Governor Spotswood, and Russell Hitt, a uh, descendant of the, the German colonists. And uh, we get to all enjoy that. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, you see that bell that we are able to ring every every time that someone comes to Virg to uh, Germana for the first time. They get to ring the bell. Uh, we use it for ceremonial purposes uh, on different holidays, particularly Memorial Day. Uh, that was a uh, a bell that was rescued from a, uh, a deconsecrated Catholic church in in California. And uh, Doug Harnsberger uh, was able to get it. And uh, we sent it back to the Bell Foundry that made it uh, about 100 years ago um, in Baltimore. A company is still in business and they, they restored it for us. Uh, so the, this is a way for, for people who descend from uh, these Germana settlers, colonists, um, Knights of the Golden Horseshoe to come back and and reconnect in a meaningful way. Um, it, like for my own family, um, I bought stones for my brothers and I um, before we had kids and, you know, their kids. And um, I have a stone that goes couple by couple all the way across the Atlantic back to Germany. Um, and, uh, and other people have done similar things to that. You see the black obelisk there in the center of the Memorial Garden. Um, that is where the, the body of John Spotswood was moved. Um, his, his, uh, his grave was in danger because of uh, um, quarrying. 
And so um, Dr. Michael Frost took it upon himself to have the body removed, reinterred. We had a, a, um, a funeral ceremony uh, to mark it. And then it's capped by that um, uh, black obelisk. Um, and, you know, the father of two Cincinnati, pretty remarkable. Uh, next, next slide. One thing that was uh, started by uh, Dr. Catherine Brown and her husband, Dr. Madison Brown, was um, annual trips to Germany. And um, this, I think, has been one of the most meaningful ways for us to reconnect with um, the ancestral villages of the, of the Germans. And um, um, the wonderful thing about this is that when, when people sign up, um, we know their families, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes they're people who are not of the Germanic colony, but they just want to go because it's such a fantastic trip. So um, Barb Price or Kathy Clore Frost or Catherine Brown will trace their family. And in one case, we found, we found the ancestral village where they were from, and we're able to take them on a side tour to see where their ancestors came from. So uh, this is just like a, a, a wonderful thing that is a great service to uh, the U.S.-German bilateral relationship that bypasses ugly periods in our history related to politics, and we can get and communicate with people directly and form friendships with uh, between Germans and Americans. And uh, it's been one of the most important things to me, and uh, I've met uh, I've met people who were distant cousins uh, to me with people whose English is um, even worse than my German. So the, the, next, uh, the next trip is June 7th through the 19th. Uh, be in contact with the Germana Foundation and uh, send in a deposit. Um, it, it may be a transformational experience for you. Uh, one of the most important things you may have done in your life. So I um, hope you can do it. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's some more information on the, the Germany trip. Those are, uh, um, those are all Americans uh, visiting uh, one of the important sites for the families. And uh, um, over, the, over the 15 years or so that we have done this, we've built up um, really deep friendships um, with some of the mayors and officials there. And um, in fact, two of our trustees, uh, Volker Schutenhelm, who's a teacher and is the head of the um, uh, German American Friendship Society of Siegen Wittgenstein uh, is one of our trustees. And then um, Professor Dr. Horst uh, Schmidtbaking, uh, who's a nuclear physicist, uh, is one of our other very energetic um, trustees, and they, they both live in Germany. Um, next page, please. Now, uh, one thing that I think that has been like a, a fruit of developing this, these friendships is um, this is a group of Germans who came over for the 300th anniversary of Germana Foundation. And all of these people come from the villages that we visit every year. And what was really, really fun is that they, they had all arrived and they were standing for a picture in front of uh, Salubria. And uh, the man on the far left uh, in the greenish jacket, that is Folkmar Klein. And he is the member of their parliament who represents them in Berlin. And he showed up and they didn't know that he was going to be there. And they were all astonished that someone that they know uh, uh, showed up to celebrate this really important time period of time. Uh, Folkmar and I met on the first Germana tour and uh, he has become a very close friend. Um, my, my son and I have been able to have uh, dinner in his house with his family. Uh, he's had dinner in my house probably half a dozen times and has visited Germana frequently. And um, 
one really great thing is that I had a, a super talented intern uh, named Nathaniel Leminski, uh, who was fresh out of high school. And he uh, was one of my interns when I worked for Congress. And I was the staff director for the Criminal Justice Subcommittee. And so uh, Nathaniel, uh, his nickname is Momo, we've become very close friends. And uh, Folkmar Klein has spoken just about every day with Momo over the last uh, couple months. And if the Christian Democrats win the election in September, uh, Momo is expected to be the chief of staff of the chancellor of Germany. So quite a remarkable Germana connection. And it all came from just uh, honest friendships developed um, from these tours to Germany, just ordinary people. Next, uh, next uh, picture, please. So we've talked a little bit about um, how we kind of passively attract people to Germana and reconnect them with their, um, with their deep ancestry. Um, but um, since about May, we've developed um, a, a more proactive uh, strategy of reaching out and, uh, and connecting people with um, a part of American history that they don't very much, much know about. You know, people, people know about Jamestown. Hmm. They know about the pilgrims because they're reminded every Thanksgiving. And then there's this long gap of American history between 1620 and 1776. And we're able to go and tell them about some of the formative periods of the American uh, character that was built on the frontier at Germana. And so we have, um, we have developed what's called the Explorers Project, where we're asking uh, Germana descendants who may have a really uh, robust databases of family trees that they've developed over the years. Uh, let's turn those things upside down. Uh, rather than focusing on all the dead people, let's focus on the living people and let's make friends with people that we share a story with. And so everybody um, is broken down, organized by family. And so the people that we are, they are reaching out to and that they are asking to connect with one another through the Germana Foundation, they're all related to them. It's a way of finding cousins and new friends. So all of these wonderful friends that we've developed uh, through Germany, uh, let's, let's put it in the American context. And the, the remarkable thing is that when, when we had our first uh, transatlantic Zoom call um, for, um, for the Families Committee on this Explorers Project, we were amazed that actual Germans participated in this who are, you know, probably cousins, right? We also had uh, Germana descendants who live in New Zealand, the Netherlands, Switzerland. Uh, we know that there are people in Canada, Mexico, um, Argentina, uh, and then the Caribbean. We recently signed up a volunteer who's on a US Army project in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia. And one of the wonderful things that we had on that first phone call was uh, Mark Chaplin. He is a native Brit, lives outside of London. Through his DNA work, he discovered that he is a descendant of a World War I uh, American veteran who was over there fighting a war and fathered a child. And Mark Chaplin descends from that person and knows it's a Germana uh, descendant. We're still helping him figure out which one, but um, it, was, uh, it was wonderful to have uh, a man with an English accent on our, on our call. Next, uh, next slide. Um, you know, we travel a lot. Um, but only one of us has actually gone to the moon. And uh, that's Buzz Aldrin. And uh, um, that's the Germana flag, eh, probably not actually planted on the, on the moon. That, that part might be fake. But, um, 
But Buzz Aldrin, with the help of the U.S. taxpayer, um, landed on the moon in July, on July 20th, 1969. And uh, it's always a wonderful thing that usually around our, our reunion, it's always about the time of the anniversary of, of Buzz Aldrin landing on the moon. Next, uh, next page. And uh, what's, uh, what's really cool uh, is that, um, you know, I, I think one of the great things about Germana is that we are so grateful uh, to be Americans. And uh, gratitude just, just runs through um, Germana. And when Buzz Aldrin landed uh, on the moon, he showed gratitude to his creator and took communion. And uh, what I think is also wonderful is that uh, the chalice you see on the left is, a, is an exact copy uh, in pewter of the Oberfischbach chalice that was used by Reverend Hager um, um, in the Oberfischbach parish. And when you go to um, go with Germana to, to go see these ancestral villages, you always get an opportunity to see that chalice that was used by Reverend Hager to administer to his, his um, uh, flock, uh, some of whom also emigrated with him to Germana. Um, so when the um, Order of St. John, the Johanniter Orden in Germany, held their first convocation outside of Germany in nine hundred years. Uh, it was held in Washington, D.C., and one of the gifts that the Americans gave to, um, to the commander of the order, uh, who was in Berlin, was a copy of the Oberfischbach chalice, because this, the Germana story is so important. So there were about, um, I think there were exactly 10 copies made um, the measurements were done by our friends in Oberfischbach and sent to us. Um, I have one of them, and uh, my children um, had their first communion uh, with that chalice, which is a wonderful 350-year-old tradition. Next, uh, next page. Um, one way that we're also reaching out to find people is, is Americans are just crazy for DNA tests. Uh, they think that their, uh, um, their background is Swedish, and then they decide, oh my gosh, I've got all this Scottish, I need to, uh, you know, dump all my sweaters and get kilts. So uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, we have a, a Germana DNA project uh, that we encourage people to take DNA tests. Uh, get registered, help us piece together things uh, that we can show. Uh, Glenn Cress um, is the head of, of one DNA project, which focuses, focuses on the, uh, the X and the Y chromosomes, which are straight male line, straight female line descent. Uh, remarkably, we have found some straight female line descents going all the way back to the colonists. And it's run by Glenn Cress. Um, very smart guy, worked in uh, mission control during the Apollo program and also, uh, also for the, uh, the shuttle program. And then Steven Sluter has picked up the challenge of doing, uh, um, doing some of the DNA work um, that, is in, that cuts across between the male and the, and the female lines so you can fill in those gaps, but the accuracy doesn't extend beyond, you know, maybe six generations. So what's really important with that is that we piece it together like, um, uh, like a quilt um, to, to find out and confirm people's, um, people's descent. And what is very important um, uh, to me about the Germana DNA project is that Dr. Eric Larson is, um, head of our archaeology program, and um, we, we do not know uh, where the Germans were buried. We know uh, among the first colony, about 20% uh, of the colony uh, died during their stay there. 
uh, when the 1717 group came, uh, their mortality was much lower, probably because they learned some lessons from the from uh, the people who arrived in 1714. But we don't know where they were buried. I suspect it was inside the fort because that's what they did at Jamestown to conceal deaths from um, potential enemies. Um, but we don't know where they're buried. And if there are remains that we can locate, you know, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes dental molars will survive even the harshest conditions. Inside a molar, you can extract DNA, even from uh, an old tooth that's 300 years old. And it would be great if we could give that person a name and, um, and celebrate their life uh, by connecting them with, with descendants. Next page. Kathy Clore Frost has what Ancestry.com told me is the largest curated German-American database in the world. And it's, it's housed here at the Germana Foundation. Um, uh, we work very hard to provide her with new data, new leads, new documentation, but we leave it to her to include new, new information so that 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 database can remain pristine and accurate where everything is documented. We're now up to 130,000 people. Uh, the Explorers Project is you know, kind of turning that upside down uh, where we look for living people that we can reconnect uh, to this uh, living community uh, that, that now spans the globe as we have discovered and um, making people feel that they're um, part of a family. Next, uh, next slide. Archaeology. Um, until 2013, we, uh, we, we told the story of Germana, but we had a missing piece. We did not have the fort site. Uh, in 1955, our predecessors tried to buy that site and we were rebuffed by the landowner. Uh, it later came into the possession of the University of Mary Washington. Uh, we tried for three presidencies of, uh, of Mary Washington to have a productive conversation. And we just made a very compelling case that we would love this site and that we would be the best stewards of it and that we would raise the money to do archeology. span And so it was given to us by the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, 62 acres on the proviso that we, uh, uh, we raise the money and spend as much money on archeology span as the, as the, as the, the land um, was worth. And so Russell and Joan hit, uh, Russell, just passed away uh, about a year ago. Uh, they built uh, the Hit Archaeology Center. Russell is a lifelong builder. His dad had a construction firm that Russell later ran. Uh, it's now in its uh, third generation. Uh, the fourth generation works for the firm. Um, um, and so we have an archaeology center that will um, probably service us for a hundred years of work. And we have in the center of it, a, uh, a time capsule uh, that will be opened in about 50 years when my eldest son, who is a rising senior in high school, my daughter is a rising junior, uh, they will be retired by then. And uh, they'll open it up and see what I have in store for them. And many other people have have messages to uh, the future. And we also have um, a pot of money that we raised and is being invested over a 50 year period. So those people who open it up get to help decide what Germana project they want to fund. Uh, next, uh, next, next page. Um, this is, uh, this is when we just started, uh, so exciting. Once we, got the, once we got the archaeology site in 2013, we had a lot of cleanup. There was a lot of, a lot of things that had um, um, 
had deferred maintenance on. We had to get, I had to take care of that. Um, but uh, here is uh, Dr. Eric Larson on the far uh, right. Um, and on the left uh, is Bill Kelso, our trustee and uh, archeology span hero. Next page. Bill is very generous with his time advising Eric and working with the young people that we hire every summer. Uh, next page. He is the discoverer of the, the fort at Jamestown, which you see down there in the lower, lower left, uh, author of two books on the, on the work that he did. And uh, he was um, uh, the queen um, came to review his work um, for the 400th anniversary and, and, and uh, uh, Bill got to escort Queen Elizabeth II uh, around Jamestown and then was uh, later, later knighted uh, by Queen Elizabeth II. So we're very grateful to have him on our board. So here's a, a little a little overview there of uh, of the site where you can see um, the lower pin marks um, the Germana Visitor Center. The pin on the on uh, on the top identifies the likely uh, location of uh, of Fort Germana and the archaeology uh, being done on the Enchanted Castle. Um, so the, the bottom part is 170 acres. Um, we gave 100 acres to build Germana Community College, which transformed thousands of lives because it's, it's, the, it's the first uh, higher education that people get um, yeah, in the Piedmont, I would say. Um, next page, please. So our mission statement you know, is for the foundation. The Germana Foundation tells America's story of liberty through the frontier experience of her settlers and descendants using archeological, historical, and genealogical research and interpretation. Um, but really, um, what, what's, how does this affect Americans? How does this affect our members? What do we want to have the impact on on our members? And I want to I want to read something that is from Roger Scruton that I uh, used for the uh, he's a British philosopher just passed away, and I and I used it for our Germana record number five forward, and I think this is this is really goes to the heart of what I think is is great about uh, Germana and our service to our country. Um, uh, Scruton says the Anglo-Irish statesman and philosopher Edmund Burke's view of society as an association of the dead, the living, and the unborn carries a precious hint as to how the responsibility for future generations arises. It arises from love, and love directed toward what is unknown must arise from what is known. The future is not known, nor are the people who will inhabit it. But the past is known, and the dead, our dead, are still the objects of love and veneration. It is by expending on them for some part of our care, Burke believed, that we care also for the unborn. For we plant in our hearts the transgenerational view of society that is best guarantee that we will moderate our present appetites in the interests of those who are yet to be. The point is very obvious in family life. The dead and our gratitude towards them are woven into the narrative of domestic love. Tender feelings toward ancestors and those of whom uh, family stories are told prepare us to make room in our hearts for our successors whose affection we wish to earn. We learn to circumscribe our demands, to see our own place in things as part of a continuous chain of giving and receiving, and to recognize that the good things we inherit are not ours to spoil, but ours to use wisely 
and pass on. And, and I think all of us want that for each other. We make, we, by engaging with Germana Foundation, no matter where you come from, if you just happen to be uh, into uh, discovering Germana for yourself, you're brand, to, you're brand new to America and you're learning about what makes them the American character. I hope that, that, that you will meet wonderful people who have this multi-generational view of good stewardship and passing on the blessings that we have been given and we don't understand why we got them in the first place. And I think that that's, you know, that's, that's something that we want to rub off on all of our members. And I think that that's really, really important. And I hope that you, you think about who you can invite into that, into that Germana circle. So let me close with the next, with the next slide. Um, you know, here we have <clears throat> Buzz Aldrin returning from the moon. Uh, it's been a few more, uh, rotations around the globe since 19, around the sun since 1969. Um, but when he returned to Germana, we were able to give him, um, you know, an image of our little uh, command module, which is the visitor center. And uh, uh, we hope that that was meaningful to him. It was really meaningful uh, to give it to him, um, an American hero who has expanded the human experience beyond um, uh, Earth, and um, you know, and, and now he has an image of where lots of wonderful things happen on on behalf of our country. Uh, next slide. So this is the slide I always close with because I just think T. S. Eliot just grabs it, and this is so Germana, um, um, because this is who we are. We're we're explorers. We came to explore. And we, we, we have uh, continued to explore, even once the frontier closed, um, we're still exploring uh, medicine, commerce, technology, space exploration. So T.S. Eliot writes, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So thank you all. I'm I'm happy to answer any questions. I uh, I only have six more hours. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for that. That was terrific. We do have some questions for you. So um, let's see what the first what's the first one here. Has anyone calculated the approximate number of Germana descendants living in the U.S. North America today? No, and it, and I think it's a it's a very very hard number to um, to calculate um, because the numbers I saw they I think that their their sense of how many people uh, had large families in the past is uh, wildly ridiculous, um, and then they don't take into consideration where we have pockets of Germana descendants who stay in a place for a long time. So like the, the church, Hebron Lutheran Church, that kept a lot of people uh, in Madison County for a very long time. Um, there was a church split 200 years ago. Some of them founded um, Hopeful Lutheran Church um, in Kentucky. And so a large number of Germana people moved and then continued to stay around that church. So the longer they stay in one place, they tend to marry distant cousins, and that cuts down on the number of, uh, of potential descendants. But we're hoping with the Explorers Project, uh, we can use new um, sophisticated tools that people in the past have not been able to use. And we might be able to get, a, get an answer to that um, that eluded earlier generations. Thank you. Um, this one's a little long, so bear with me. Um, Susan uh, visited the Hyde Height settlement near Winchester and noticed that um, there was that was settled in 1730 or so. She noted that Reverend Stover visited both the church near Winchester and Hebron Lutheran Church. 
Was there a connection between these two settlements? And did the settlements in the Shenandoah Valley not push natives west, making Ger Germana safe for settlement and a fort no longer necessary? Um, you know, there's no record that the, that the Fort Germana was ever attacked. And we think that the probability was low, but not zero. So remember, um, they were mostly concerned about the French. And uh, the Iroquois Confederacy up in New York ranged as far south as North Carolina, uh, attacking other Indian tribes because they wanted to have a monopoly on the fur trade. So, um, so you know, there was always a possibility that there would be some attack uh, related, to, uh, related to the fur trade from tribes all the way up in New York State. I mean, incredible, right? And um, so there were also um, uh, the Heights, uh, Yost Height um, was a, a very large investor and brought in other Germans to settle in the Valley of Virginia. A lot of the Valley was settled by Germans who were migrating west and then moved south from Pennsylvania. Um, but there was a lot of interaction with German speakers. And we do have uh, diaries of Moravian ministers who came down to Pennsylvania um, ministering to German speakers. And um, in, um, they, they always had good pastoral coverage uh, through Hebron, but at Germantown in Southern Fauquier, uh, they did not. After, after Hager died, um, Holtzclaw was a leader or a reader, uh, but they didn't have an ordained pastor for a very, very long time. So these Moravians would come down and they would baptize um, German speaking people of Germana extraction. Um, and they had really good diaries. And so um, the, this is a really good source of material. Um, and, it, and it gives us a, a, a clearer understanding that there was a lot of circulation of people and they, they tended to move in networks. So um, there's a uh, book right here, in fact, uh, Making for America, which I ordered from, uh, from Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, uh, Alexander Spotswood makes a good appearance in here and he had a little Scottish network that he maintained. Um, the, the Moravians maintained a German network. And um, so you just, you, you find that where there's just a lot of, a lot of networks that, that cross and, um, and people were in very good communication. You also have to remember that Philadelphia um, under Christopher Sauer um, uh, particularly had a very thriving British language press um, that uh, kept people in contact throughout North America. Um, so very, uh, very interesting. You know, Chris, uh, I, you know, they went. There were um, there were some partnerships in Philadelphia with Benjamin Franklin, and they published books in German together. You know, it's just it's like it's an all American intertwined. Story. <laughs> right. It's a great American story. Right. Um, Faye wants to know if we know the names of the English who lived in Germana. Um, um, Barb Price descends from uh, George Hume, I think his name was, yes. and yep. uh, so he was a, a Scottish kinsman of um, of Governor Spotswood. Um, uh, this book, Making for America, talks about a uh, silversmith who uh, got in trouble for being a Jacobin, or not a Jacobin, a uh, Jacobite. A Jacobite in Scotland and had to leave. And so a, a relative of Spotswood put him in contact with this young man and helped him get resettled at uh, Williamsburg. Um, you know, so um, um, I'm sure that there were English there and I just, I'm not the one to know about it, but I think that there were, uh, like Hume, there were other people who were overseers. Um, uh, one of the members of the Ball family opened a, uh, a tavern at Germana. And uh, about the same time that um, um, Mary Ball Washington, George Washington's mother died, 
um, that tavern was destroyed by the fire. And so we have a newspaper article uh, when both both events happened in the same week. Okay, thank you. Um, this one's a little bit, another long one for you. Um, there is a spring on Duet Road that looks like an early settlement. Uh, it's in Madison. Um, and there's a drive that leads up a hill to graveyard site, very unfriendly occupants. I'm assuming the live ones around it. Um, have you looked, have we looked uh, here for possible broils, Fleshman, Fleischman burials? Um, uh, we have a lot of members who know about these places. Um, some of them have already been documented. Um, really, a, a lot of people have taken their notes and uploaded them on to find a grave. Um, and so I don't know about this specific cemetery, but I have been to um, uh, really far out of the way cemeteries up in uh, Ailer Hollow. Um, and, um, you know, in some of these cemeteries, it's very interesting. I, I went to uh, a cemetery with uh, Russell Hitt uh, up in Fauquier County. And he showed me where some of his relatives were buried in the 20th century, right? This is like, these are 60, 70 year old graves and the stone markers were never engraved. They were just field stones. And that was the practice in their family um, to mark a grave. And it was just an oral history of who was actually there. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking at two different things here. Um, Kathy Clore Frost has um, said that the Madison County Historical Society has a CD of all known burials in Madison County. So Susan, that may help you find um, those who, who's buried in those areas. And then Barb Price uh, has also kind of filled in the Francis Hume. Uh, he was a cousin of Spotswood along mm. with his brother, George. Uh, they were transported to Virginia during the Jacobite uprising. Uh, Francis Hume was at Germana and died there. So um, oh. that's, that's one of the, the burials. We, I can, there's actually a letter that's written by Hume's, um, Hume's cousin back to Scotland saying that um, Francis had died and that the Germans had surrounded his burial with pails, so wooden stakes wow. around it. Wow. So there's a, there's a little bit of, of um, extra history there on those folks. Right, and that, that goes back to Bernard Balin's view that right. um, you know ties were not severed. It was just a giant right. transatlantic network. And right. you know, we know when there was a, a settlement uh, of an estate back in Germany, one of the colonists asked, you know, I don't, I don't need any money. I'm fine here, but I do want the family Bible. And the Bible came here and it's, right. it's, it's in Fredericksburg today. Yeah. Um, Stephen wants to know when all said and done, do you see Spotswood as more of a hero or a villain? He is like everybody who has ever walked the planet. He is a mixture of uh, good and evil, right? And uh, um, sin's a complicated thing. And so sometimes uh, uh, when, when Alexander Spotswood uh, decided on policy that would be really great for Virginia, it also aligned with his own personal interests. So, um, you know, we know that there were a lot of, um, uh, a lot of land transactions that were with straw men intermediaries so that when Spotswood left office, uh, Spotswood would, would end up with these, uh, this property. And I, I think at, at somebody estimated that his holdings at one point were about 58,000 acres. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a gigantic area. So, you know, everybody who lives at Lake of the Woods is on Spotswood's land. Yes. Um, so it's just a giant area. And uh, uh, I think that there's a lot of interesting things that could be done with figuring out, you know, where did the colonists live? And, you know, is there some way that we can recognize them as heritage farms or, or the like? So it's, it's an important part of our cultural landscape. 
right. Um, we have one last question for you. Um, before I get to it, I want to um, tell everybody that we're going to keep the chat feature open for a, for a few moments so that if anybody wants to chat back and forth, they're more than welcome to do that. Um, okay. But we got one last question. What will it take to put your mana on the National Historic Register? Um, I think it means National Historic Landmark. Right, right. So we're... Um... We're already on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, we're already on the Virginia Register of mm, Historic Places, I think is what it's called. Um, but only 3% of National Register properties get to be a National Historic Landmark. So uh, it is very hard. Um, but I think that given the importance of Germana to the formation of the American character and the mixture of cultures that were there, you know, we're not dependent on one, um, you know, super um, um, person in history. We're a whole community. And so um, the interesting thing, too, is that unlike a lot of these sites, uh, we still have an active community because of the Germana Foundation. We're in, we're in constant communication with people all over the world. So um, I think that we just need to, um, uh, I think we probably need to find the fort. We need to locate that, um, um, have a conference that uh, Dr. Larson and um, um, Dr. Kelso and, and others might lead to show what we found, uh, engage other archeologists, other historians. Um, I think we need to do a better job at, um, at connecting pe with people uh, through, uh, through DNA analysis and genealogy, black and white and green and orange and everybody. Um, yeah, because it's an American site, right. uh, and and so we need to show how this is um, this relates to America's story, and so I think it will take a long time. Um, but remember, we tried to buy the archaeology site in 1955, and so it's it took us three generations basically to end up with that. So if we set a goal we'll be able to accomplish it. It just may not be in our, our lifetime. And I think that, you know, the best goals to achieve are the ones that can't be achieved in one lifetime. And so I think that this might be one of those big goals that we should just agree to and organize our message and budget and archeology span work and conferences <laughs> all around just to build the case that might take two or three generations to convince bureaucrats that, you know, we're a National yes, Historic sir. Landmark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank Mark for this great presentation. Um, thank you, sir. And I want to thank everybody who's out there for participating. And the chat feature has been just going, going crazy and for all the great questions. So thank you very much. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in.